Hello and welcome back to yet another GCSE revision video. Now guys, with the GCSE reset exams just around the corner, what I want to go over within this really short and brief lesson is the top five mistakes that GCSE students, and especially those that are doing resets, the top five mistakes that students unwittingly make that examiners absolutely hate, but will never admit, okay? Guys, for those of you that are doing resets, okay? Time might seem quite short, but remember guys, that it is never too late to buckle down and get going with your revision, with your practice, so that you can go into that exam hall feeling confident and ready. So guys, what I think will be really, really important is for you to know the top five mistakes that students always make unwittingly and examiners hate, but they will never admit to you, okay? And guys, please factor this into your practice. Also guys, I always get questions, lots of questions from my research students, even in my masterclasses saying, hey, I only have a week to go, I only have a few days to go, is it worth me practicing for these resets? And I will always say yes. Never assume that any time, no matter how much short it is in terms of your practice, none of that time is wasted, okay? So obviously count watching this lesson as working towards your reset. But also guys, don't forget that this Sunday, at 5 p.m. I'm gonna be going over the language paper one 2024 paper, especially for those of you that are doing resets as well as mocks. So make sure you sign up, okay? I'm gonna be going over not only what examiners are looking for and pitfalls to avoid, not only from this paper, but also generally from the language paper one exams. And of course, for those of you that are doing resets and you're desperate to have some model answers, especially for the question five story and descriptive writing, I share three full written model responses for my students that they can use. These are private questions and private answers, okay? So make sure you sign up and I'll be going over this and also practicing language paper one on Sunday at 5 p.m., okay? So let's go over the top five mistakes that GCSE students always make each year in their exams that examiners really hate. It drives them crazy, but they'll never admit this to you, okay? The first mistake, the first mistake that even for me, it drives me crazy, but more importantly, remember that your examiners are trained and qualified teachers, okay? And of course, they are looking for things that they seek from their students. The first and most major thing, which sounds quite basic, is actually to do with poor handwriting. Guys, for those of you that are doing your resets, majority of you are probably gonna be handwriting your response, okay? It's still a minority of students that get the option to type up their responses. You need to make sure you're writing clearly. You need to make sure you don't have that chicken scratch handwriting. Your handwriting doesn't need to be neat and perfect, okay? But it needs to be legible. Because you need to remember, guys, that when it comes to handwriting, it's a form of communication. Remember that you are going to be judged, right, and assessed on the quality of your communication. Communication not only in, in, involves what you write in your essay, but it's also how you write it. If your handwriting is chicken scratch, if it's really hard to read for your examiner, you're making them hate you just a little bit more, okay? Because remember guys, even if this sounds really harsh and quite crass, remember guys that your examiners are actually paid by the script. A lot of GCSE students and even reset students forget that the person on the end and on the other side on mark, who's marking the scripts, number one is a human being, okay? So they are affected by things like, is this person's handwriting really hard to read? If it's hard to read, I can't be bothered. Even think about it in your own perspective. When you read something that's very hard to read, you're probably not gonna wanna read it, okay? Why is your examiner any different? You will say, well, they're an examiner. Yes, they are a teacher and they're an examiner, but the other side of it also, guys, and why they might hit you just a little bit more if your handwriting is terrible, is they are paid by the script and not by the hour. So if they have to take absolute ages to read and reread what you're trying to convey, when there's some kind of room for interpretation, when you're on a borderline, are they gonna give you a five or a six? When there's that kind of space for interpretation, they're not on your side if your handwriting is terrible and they're not gonna give you that benefit of the doubt. So please avoid using bad handwriting, okay? It's a form of communication. Examiners will obviously never say that they have downgraded a student's response based on terrible handwriting, but it does factor into the final grade you get, especially if you're kind of on the borderline and you need them on your side. Don't forget that they're a human being, okay? So make their life easy. Make it easy for them to read what you're writing. Now, the second error is to do with spelling. Now, get a lot of students who are always saying, oh, spag, grammar, it's only tested in question five, okay? And that's true. 
technically and in theory spelling is tested in question five and it's assessed as worth 20% of marks. However, guys, if you're doing research in English, your examiner is highly likely going to be a qualified English teacher who's also an examiner. Well, that means guys, again, they are human being. And if they've qualified to do English, they love English. They probably spend all of their time reading books. Nothing drives an English lover more crazy than somebody who has boring or even terrible language and worse so if they just make these lazy spelling and punctuation errors guys even if spelling in theory is tested in questions five okay so question one to four technically does not have spag marks guys don't forget that even if this is a theory the reality is that your examiner is a qualified teacher they're probably quite passionate about english okay so you're trying to get them on side you're trying to do all of these things and all of these elements to make your examiner as they're reading your script okay remember they're human beings okay the person who's on the other side reading your script you want to make them have all the reasons to award you the best marks that they can award you so if you're writing using poor punctuation poor spelling you're not actually making them love you more you're making them hate you just a little bit more okay so make sure especially when they are kind of on borderline can I give this person the benefit of the doubt or not try to have the spelling in your writing be a positive reflection on your script as a student. What that means is try to focus also on the quality of your spelling. Try and get accurate spelling throughout all five of your questions, okay? Remember guys, a lot of students forget that examiners are literally human beings. Try to work with them. Try to make them come on side, okay? Try to make them actually like your writing and the quality of your writing through your handwriting and your spelling. That's the top two mistakes that examiners will never admit, but they absolutely hate. Now the third thing, okay, and this is actually specifically related to the all important AO2, assessment objective two, is the incorrect labeling of subject terminology. Guys, every Sunday at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. in my language paper one and language paper two masterclass, what I did is I've prepared a framework that I sent to all of my students, literally writing and listing language techniques that you should use for question four and structure tech, sorry, for question two, and structure techniques that you should use for question number three. And I make it really clear that you shouldn't mix the two, okay? And obviously all of my students are part of that masterclass. Not only are they crystal clear on those structure and language techniques and how to use them, and but most importantly, guys, you need to make sure when you're talking and analyzing that subject terminology that you label language and structure correctly and accurately this is for question two and three in language paper one. And of course, also you want to see question four in language paper one as a combination of these skills. Okay. AO2 is something that is really underestimated a lot of students. And probably if you're doing your research, you probably mislabeled terminology. Again, guys, if you join my 5 PM Sunday masterclass, not only are you going to get this framework, but also you can ask me questions. You can say, okay, I was thinking of talking about this technique. Do you think that's something that examiners are looking for? Or should I talk about this? And of course, you're going to get my feedback on that during my live lesson every Sunday at 5 p.m. Now, the fourth thing that examiners absolutely hate but will never tell you is the use of really long quotes when supporting a student's statement or the point that they're making, be it to do with how the writer uses language, how the writer has structured the text to interest you as a reader. Students using way too long quotations. Guys, remember that. In your essay, you are not describing what's happening in the story that you're given in the fiction extract in paper one or the non-fiction extracts in paper two. You're not describing that. What you're doing is you're taking a small section of the quotations, right? So you need to sh select short quotes, sh even shorten them if you need to with ellipsis. But then what you're doing is analyzing and unpacking, okay? So examiners hate to see when students are writing two or three lines made up of a quote because all you're doing is taking time away from analyzing the effect of that quote. And this goes to the fifth and final thing that examiners find every single year in student scripts that they absolutely hate. And this is students, when they take a quotation, which I would suggest obviously making a quote short, students who do not explain the effect of a quotation. They select a quotation. They even mention the relevant subject terminology, alliteration for language, or for example, zooming in for structure. But then they label that, and then they don't say how that impacts us as readers. Or 
if they really want to infuriate the examiners, they say the following, which you should never say in your recent exams. It makes the reader want to read on. That's not explaining any form of effect. All you're just doing is writing empty, meaningless words. Guys, you need to make sure you talk about the effect. What kind of tone is it setting? How does it make us as readers feel? What kind of atmosphere is being portrayed? How is the author or the character being conveyed? That's you now thinking about the effect, okay? And how does that make us as readers feel? Again, guys, in my Sunday um, masterclasses every week at 5 p.m. on Sundays, I go over this. I write literal model answers for my students that they can use. And I color code each paragraph. And in the explanation part, I literally highlight to my students, this is exactly how you unpack a quotation. So in your recent exams, right, when you're doing your resets, you need to make sure you are explaining the effect. If it's language, structure, whatever it is, you need to be talking about the effect, not just having some long quotation, mentioning a terminology, and then just leaving it at that, because that's not gonna get you any marks, okay? Examiners absolutely hate it. So guys, that's really it when it comes to your recent exams, okay? They're just around, around the corner. Remember guys, that any time spent revising is not wasted. You watching this video, you have revised. You now know the key pitfalls to avoid, okay? When it comes to handwriting, spelling, terminology, long quotes, and effects. And as I said, guys, you don't have to figure this out by yourself, okay? You can literally join in my 5 p.m. Sunday masterclass and ask me questions. Also see how I literally write the model answers, which I then share with all of my students. And as I said, guys, I literally have shared with my students three model answers that they can use. And it, not only when it comes to planning any story, but also the language that they can use for the um, creative writing portion of the language paper one. Okay, so of course, if you join in, you'll also be getting access to that as you're preparing for language paper one and your language paper two exams, okay? So guys, I hope that helped. And of course, as you're gearing up for your resets, make sure you literally buckle down and practice, download past papers and practice, practice, practice. Thanks so much for listening.